thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're thrilled to be presenting another program for your enjoyment and your education tonight. We think this will be a great program. I'm Jane Lang, I'm the director of the Nina Historical Society, and we're presenting a new program this evening. We're happy that you're joining us here in person, and we're also happy that you're joining us online. So we hope that you'll learn a lot tonight and enjoy this presentation. We're starting a new program series tonight um, called Founders and Settlers, and this is a collaborative effort between the Nina Historical Society and Menasha Historical Society, and we're so grateful for the partnership that we have um, working with our two historical societies. Um, this evening, the bulk of the presentation will be presented by Tom Van Leeshout and his brother Jim Van Leeshout. Tom and Jim have done a tremendous amount of research on this topic, so we're very grateful for all that they have done. We're grateful as well for Nick Jevney and all that he does for videotaping our presentations, so thank you, Nick, for that. Um, Kathy Humsky from Menasha Historical Society is also part of the presentation tonight, so thank you, Kathy. So as I mentioned, the topic, um, Pioneers and Settlers, we wanted to focus on some of the stories of our community, of some of those early names that you might be familiar with, but you don't necessarily know the stories behind them. So three of the founding families of Nina and Menasha that you probably have recognized their names in the past, Governor Doty, his son Charles Doty, Harvey Jones, Curtis Reed, Harrison Reed, these are names that people are familiar with. But we wanted to kind of differentiate tonight between what a founder is versus a settler. So we're considering some of these um, gentlemen as being founders of our two communities because they were the financiers and the politicians behind the organization of the communities. In our previous um, program, uh, Hidden History of Doty Island, we had a uh, featured a story on railroads and depots, and that wonderful presentation is available online on our YouTube channel if you're interested in watching that. But within that program, you will learn a little bit more about how the reeds had an impact on the railroads and the history of Doty Island in that sense. So please um, visit our YouTube channel to learn more about that story. Tonight, we're talking about settlers in the area. And I'd like to read just a short excerpt out of the book Fur, Furs, and Ford Rainier by William Brown. This helps you get an understanding of how the pioneers and settlers were, um, what they were considering, what they were moving into as they were moving west and into Wisconsin. Between 1820 and 1838, the United States offered more than 122 million acres of public lands for sale. In Wisconsin, 178,783 acres were sold at an average price of $1.27 per acre and were tax exempt for five years. As the military moved in, Wisconsin became more attractive to American settlers. Until the 1820s, most of the residents of Wisconsin were either French or English Canadians working on the fur trade with the local Indian tribes. In 1800, there were only 50 residents identified as living in Green Bay. In 1800, sorry, in 1820, when Cass and Doty toured Wisconsin by canoe, there were 651 civilians and 804 military personnel living in Michigan territory, west of Lake Michigan in our area, and an area that also included present-day Minnesota and Iowa. So that gives you a sense of uh, why uh, people were moving into this area and how they were able to establish themselves. So some of the names of the settlers that we'll be talking about in the months to come, you can see on the slide. Tonight's program will be featuring the story of Joseph Jourdain. And Joseph Jourdain um, was the first permanent settler in the town of Menasha. Um, very interesting story, first blacksmith in the state of Wisconsin, so really an incredible story, and what I think is particularly interesting for us tonight is 
um, Jim and Tom Van Leeshout are descendants of Joseph Jordan, and it's always exciting for me when family descendants are able to talk about and research and then talk about their ancestors. So we're thrilled to have them presenting that for us tonight. In the fall, we'll be doing a program on Harvey and John Kimberly, so I hope you'll come back and join us for that as we move forward in this series. The reason that we, um, or the thought behind who we were choosing as far as settlers go, we had a lot of interesting information in local newspapers, and some of the descendants of the early Nina Menasha settlers were featured in various articles. That's how we were able to determine who it was who was considered an early settler. So we do a lot of our research using newspapers.com, and that's how we learn about the past. We hope you will enjoy this presentation tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Jane. And I'd also like to welcome you to this video presentation and also those who are here in attendance. It's a pleasure to present the series, The Founders and Settlers of Nina Menasha. Tonight, our main focus, as Jane mentioned, are the earliest settlers, Joseph Jordan and his descendants. This evening, we'll present the story in three sections. The Menominee Nation land to U.S. territory, who was Joseph Jordan, and his descendants and their lasting legacy. Before I begin with the details, let me introduce my brother Jim and myself and explain how we fit into both the Nina and Menasha story, as well as the Joseph Jordan story. As Jane mentioned, I'm Tom Van Leeshout, and Jim and I both were born at Theta Clark, lived on Hewitt Street in Nina, and Nicolay Boulevard in Menasha. Graduated from St. Patrick's Grade School and Menasha High School. Jim? Well, thank you, Tom, and, and welcome. Well, Tom and I both graduated from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and then we went our separate ways. Now we're back here living in Nina, and what we're really talking about is our tie to the sixth generation of descendants of Joseph Jordan. He was our great, great, great grandfather. Tonight, we have the honor of presenting his story. In this first section, we'll look at the several decade process of transferring Menominee Nation land to U.S. territory. This land was, will eventually become the cities of Nina Menasha. This history lesson combines the integration of many cultures, the transformation of the society to the values of our ancestors. We are all part of this history and as six generations of Winnebago Rapids descendants. Back to Tom. We begin tonight by looking at the events that set into motion the possibility of homesteading in our area. This story starts in 1814 in Europe in the city of Ghent. The Treaty of Ghent was the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812 between the United States and the United Kingdom. The possession of the land that will become Wisconsin depended on these negotiations. The following is a recap of the treaty's outcome from Wikipedia. In August 1814, peace discussions began in the neutral city of Ghent. The British opened with their demands, the most important of which was the creation of an Indian barrier state in the former Canadian Southwest Territory the area from Ohio to Wisconsin. It was understood that the British would sponsor the Indian state. For decades, the British strategy had been to create a buffer state to block American expansion. The Americans refused to consider a buffer state. In doing so, President Adams articulated a strong imperial claim of sovereignty over all peoples living within the boundaries of the United States. The British negotiators presented the barrier state as an essential condition for peace, and the impasse brought negotiations to the brink of breakdown. In the end, the British government backed down and accepted Article 9, 
in which both governments promise to make peace with their indigenous foes and to restore native peoples to all possessions, rights, and privileges which they may have enjoyed or been entitled to in 1811. In essence, the British, exhausted by the Napoleonic Wars, eager for peace, gave in and Wisconsin became a possession of the United States government permanently. Over the next several decades, the Native American tribes will negotiate with the U.S. government for their land. During this time, before becoming a state, Wisconsin will be part of the Illinois Territory and then part of the Michigan Territory. In addition, complicating matters for the Wisconsin tribe, Wisconsin tribes, the eastern tribes were being relocated west, causing land division conflicts. In 1822, Eliezer Williams headed two delegations from New York to negotiate with Wisconsin tribes in efforts to relocate the Oneida, the Muncie, the Stockbridge, and Brothertown tribes. Both Williams and the migration situation will play into our story this evening. Let's explore a few of the treaties that were steps in the process of the land becoming the cities of Needham and Asha. This, this map of Wisconsin is divided by the land held by each specific tribe and the year the land was ceded to the U.S. government. We'll be concentrating this evening on the land held by the Menominee Nation, shaded in gray. Like most Midwestern tribes, the Menominee sided with the British during the War of 1812. After the conflict ended, the United States made peace with the tribes, which were opposed to it during the war. The first treaty the Menominee Nation signed to, with the U.S. government was in 1817. This treaty, signed in St. Louis, Missouri, restored a state of peace between the U.S. and Menominee. The tribe sold no land at this time. In 1821, the Menominee entered into a treaty negotiations with the Ho-Chunk, Chippewa, and Winnebago to provide land for the tribes emigrating from New York. Through the resulting treaty, the New York tribes received 860,000 acres, followed by a second treaty in 1822, ceding 6.7 million acres, almost the entire west, western shore of Lake Michigan. The treaty was strongly opposed by so many tribes, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the treaty. The federal government sought on several occasions to mediate the dispute between the tribes. The opportunity to resolve the unratified treaty came in 1827 at a treaty council held at Little Lake Butamore. The council at was attended by 5,000 Native Americans. In the painting, lower right, Governor Lewis Cass of Michigan and Thomas McKinney, head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, arrived by boat to meet with the Menominee Indian leaders to ratify Indian Treaty Number 148. In the end, only the Menominee ceded land to the New York tribes. The Menominee did not view this as a great loss because the area had not been part of their original homeland. The land received by the displaced tribes is noted in the areas circled in red. Again, these were the Oneida, Muncie, Stockbridge, and Brothertown tribes. On the left, highlighted in pink, was the land ceded to the U.S. government in 1831 with the Treaty of Washington. The area will include the future Door County, Green Bay, Sheboygan, and Manitowoc area. Also note on this map are the original Native American terms for the various bodies of water. In the treaty, the Menominee ceded about 2.5 million acres of their land, primarily adjacent to Lake Michigan. During the ratification of the treaty the next year, the U.S. Senate modified the treaty to provide additional land to the Stockbridge and Muncie. The Menominee did not agree with the changes, and the treaty was renegotiated October of 1832 to resolve the differences. These two treaties were commonly referred singularly as the Treaty of Washington. In ceding the land, the Menominee received $95,000 for clothing, provisions, and annuities. They also received $20,000 for the additional 
700, 780 square miles transferred to the Stockbridge Muncie. A permanent village was granted to the Menominee as a reward for providing the territory for the New York tribes. Established for the education of the Nominee people, it would include a sawmill, blacksmith, and log homes available for their use. This village would be named Winnebago Rapids and situated at the mouth of Lake Winnebago. Let us take a look at the details of the proposed village. Well, let's start back into the, the 1830s, to the beginning of the Winnebago Rapids Settlement Project. On the left is a layout of the proposed settlement project. First, the major landmarks are referenced in red. A, Little Lake Butemore. B, Lake Winnebago. C, the Menasha Dam. D, the Nina Dam. And E, the settlement of Winnebago Rapids, opened in 1834. Next, let's look at the proposed layout of the settlement. The five farmhouses are in blue. The 35 block houses in three sections in yellow. And the mill and the blacksmith shop are in red. On the right is the picture of one of the sections of the block homes. This proposed settlement, as well as all Native American Indian matters, fell under the Indian Commission of the United States War Department. One of the policies of this department was to quote, teach Indian tribes the art of Christian civilization so they will assimilate into the white man's society, unquote. This is the philosophy used in the development of Winnebago Rapids project, attempting to civilize the Menominee tribe in this area. The Menominee were to be receiving farming instructions to teach them agricultural skills, for a period of 10 years, plus a grist mill and lumber mill on the Fox River, 35 block houses, a gunsmith and blacksmith shop. Additionally, the government gave them $8,000 in clothing, $1,000 in food, $1,000 in cash, and a $6,000 annuity for 12 years. The final provision reserved the right to hunt and fish in the ceded land. The block houses were made of hewn timbers, secured by locking the ends with split shingles. They were regarded as a grade better than common log houses, as they could be finished and even plastered. As government projects go, unlimited dollars would be spent for the mechanics tools and farming implements. The blacksmith shop and farms were completely supplied with needed equipment. The first inhabitant of this planned settlement was Nathaniel Perry, appointed by the government to teach farming techniques. Homes were to be built for farmers, a miller, and a blacksmith. Five females, thought to be the wives of the farmers, were to be employed to teach school for $60 per year. The upper left picture of one of the two-story schoolhouses. Here is a description of the blockhouses from a tale of Twin Cities. 33 log houses were contracted to be built for occupation by the Menominee Indians as part of the mission experiment. They were to include one-story common log houses and smaller two-story block houses. Most structures were to be 20 by 16 feet in size. Each Indian family was to be allotted two and one half acres of land as well. The buildings were to be used as models for the Indians when they built their own homes. The houses were to be constructed in three rows with 10 houses in each row. One row was chartered to be built on the west shore of Little Lake Butemore, stretching from Fritzy Park to the south end of the lake. A second row was to be built along what is now Wisconsin Avenue from the present Valley Inn to Riverside Park. A third row of houses was scheduled to be distributed from the Council Tree Point to present Doty Avenue. On the left, in soft orange, 
is the land ceded in 1836. By the 1830s, the rich lands of Wisconsin had attracted the interest of settlers, and the federal government sought to buy land from the Wisconsin Native Indians to make room for the hungry land population. In 1836, the Menominee sold most of their land in northeastern Wisconsin to a small and a small strip along the Wisconsin River to the United States via the, city, the Treaty of Cedars. This historical marker on the right, located by Highway 36, just west of Little Chute, is near where these negotiations took place. Some of the Wisconsin cities of Marinette, Appleton, Nina, Menasha, Oshkosh, and Stevens Point are today within this area. The six-day meeting ended in a spirit of mutual respect and fairness. Governor Dodge said, quote, I view it as a matter of first importance to do the Indian ample justice in all of our treaty stipulations, end quote. The Menominee Chief Oshkosh later affirmed, quote, we always thought much of Governor Dodge as an honest man, end quote. The treaty took effect February 15, 1837, and the Menominee began moving to the west of the Wolf River. The Treaty of Cedars provided the Menominee with $20,000 in cash, $3,000 worth of food provisions, 2,000 pounds of tobacco, 30 barrels of salt, and 500 uh, for the agricultural supplies such as plows and cattle every year for 20 years. The United States also agreed to pay off $100,000 of debts the Menominee had incurred with local fur traders. At the same time, the Menominee were not just adjusting well to the living in houses, preferring their wigwams. And in less than three years, the Winnebago Rapids project was abandoned. That is what was explained in an excerpt from A Tale of Two Cities. The effort to persuade the Menominees to live in the houses was futile. The Indians built fires in the middle of the rooms, as had been their custom in the wigwams. During the severe winter months, several of the Indians erected their wigwams inside the buildings. The floors were ripped up for firewood, and eventually they used the buildings to stable their horses. Since the Menominee women had, for centuries, tilled the soil and the males had done the hunting and fishing, the men adapted poorly to farming. Planting and harvesting were usually done too late. What harvesting could have been done was destroyed by their horses who were allowed to pasture in the fields. Cattle and oxen, provided by the government, were thought to be better used for food than as beasts of burden or for milking. The education of the young had been the responsibility of the elders who passed on traditions, skills, and oral folklore. The children roamed in and out of the school and seldom prepared their lessons. So little success did the five women teachers have in maintaining discipline in the classroom that they gave up their efforts. This slide depicts before and after the treaty. First, representing wigwams on the bottom, and then the settlement on the top. Through the treaty, the Menominee also agreed to relinquish the 1831 treaty provisions of agricultural instructors, a grist mill and lumber mill, a gunsmith and blacksmith shop. In exchange for releasing the United States from these responsibilities, the federal government put $76,000 into stocks for the tribe. Interest in these stocks was to be paid to the, to the tribe annually. Several of the block houses were then occupied by traders and craftsmen. As a true settler and citizen, they would have preemptive rights over the, you know, under the federal law to purchase the land they were squatting upon. The block house pictured on the left was the last one standing. This and the two-story home were both owned by Reverend O.P. Clinton. The two-story house was turned into the first Congregational Church of Nina by Reverend Clinton. 
Before we leave this section, we would like to define a term for, for the community of settlers. The term you'll be hearing is a French word, Mati. The best explanation of the Mati community comes from the internet, Wikipedia to be specific. Mati people in the United States are a specific culture and community who descend from unions between Native American and early European colonist parents, usually indigenous women who married French men who worked as fur trappers and traders during the 17th to 19th centuries in the fur trade era. They developed as an ethnic and cultural group from the descendants of these unions. In the French colonies, people of mixed indigenous and French ancestry were referred to by those who speak French as Métis, meaning mixture. Being bilingual, these people were able to trade European goods, such as muskets, for the furs and hides at a trading post. These Métis were found throughout the Great Lakes area and to the Rocky Mountains. While the word in this usage originally had no ethic designation, it grew to describe a specific ethnicity by the early 19th century. Mati descendants remain today, mainly in Canada, and have adopted symbols to reinforce a collective mixed identity and create a sense of pride. The next section, we will focus on one of the settlers who remain in the black homes. The Green Bay Mati community will play a big role in this settler's family. The rest of our presentation will concentrate on the blacksmith of the Winnebago Rapids settlement, Joseph Jourdain and his descendants. Jourdain was born in Canada, moved to Green Bay, and eventually to our area. This section, we will learn who this man was and how he fits into the development of the Nina Menasha story. His story will cover, cover several themes. He was the first blacksmith in the Wisconsin Territory, maker of the di uh, distinguished pipe tomahawk, a businessman who traded with the local Native American Indians, and the first permanent residence in the area that was what was the town of Menasha and now Fox Crossing. Born January 12, 1780, in Three Rivers, near Montreal, Canada, Joseph moved to Green Bay in 1798, where he worked as a gunsmith and blacksmith for Mr. Franks, a trader inside French foreign trading post known as Le Bay. Later, Fort Howard would be built on this spot in 1816. At age 23, on January 2, 1803, he married Marguerite Granville. Marguerite, born in Prairie de Sheen, was a granddaughter of Chief El Espanol of the Menominee. With this marriage, the Jordanes became members of the Green Bay Mati community. The Jordanes had eight children, two boys, six girls. One of the girls dies in childhood. Both of the boys, William and Thomas, will follow their father's lead and become blacksmiths. Joseph, a devout Catholic, was supporter of several church pro building projects and provider of salaries and settlement costs of several priests. He was treasurer of his church for several years. Upper right is the Jordan homestead, built in 1817 close to the river's bank, near an area that became Fort Howard, lower right. There are a number of French Canadian families living around the fort at that time. The large log house was built in the style of most frontier French settlers. Recognized as the oldest residence in the, green, in the city of Green Bay and the scene of daughter Mary's wedding to Eliezer Williams in 1823, the building was destroyed by fire in 1884. Jourdain worked independently for several years and then as a blacksmith for a British detachment in Green Bay. Later, he worked for the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs at Prairie du Chien after the U.S. government began regulating the Western fur trade. By 1832, his annual salary was $480. This is what the Appalachian Post Crescent said of Joseph in a recap of his life. 
Jordine was five feet six inches tall, straight as an arrow, powerfully built, and was a handsome man. He was known and esteemed far and wide in all the West in his day, an old newspaper account reads. He was known for a generous and amiable personality which did not permit anyone, because of poverty, to be turned away from his shop and his talents. His wife, a Creole, was famed as a huntress and was reputed to kill any game which came into her rifle sights. Joseph was able to turn his craft into a profession outside of the settlement work, first working for French fur trader Jacob Franks, providing materials for trade with the Menominee fur trader, tra uh, trappers. Next, Jourdain and another business partner, Peter Chefflot, purchased the Limehouse, pictured here, in 1830 for use as a residence and trading post. Jourdain, popular with the Menominee, who loved him as a brother, exchanged their furs for his tomahawks from Green Bay to Fond du Lac and beyond. As noted in the headlines, and the headline, the Limehouse is the oldest house in the state of Wisconsin, a cut stone building with massive three foot thick walls with a 16 by 24 living room. Traders may well have sat by a roaring fire in the room, supported by rough cut timbers while trading for the tomahawks. His trademark, the Copper Crescent, would bear his initials JJ on the front entrance of the old Limehouse. Built on the shores of Green Bay for easy access to the traders, it is currently on the Wisconsin Historical Registry. Upper left is the 1850 studio portrait of a Fox River trapper, Augustin Greeno, seated holding a Jordan tomahawk. Greeno operated a trading post and farm in Kukana. His farm is where the Greeno Mansion is located. Jordan was a skilled blacksmith. In 1798, he provided metal tools and household utensils for frontier settlers. He was best known for his pipe tomahawk. This special tomahawk was made from old gun barrels and doubled as a pipe. Made from an old French penny, Joseph's trademark was inlaid with a copper crescent moon. Ironwood saplings were used for the handle of the pipe. The pipe tomahawk, upper right, was on display at the Green Bay Neville Museum. Also at the museum are these wrought iron toaster and pot holders, and the serving fork from a wedding gift cutlery set made for his daughter Mary. The same Appleton Post Crescent article further said of Jordan's talent. Jordan was a mainstay to the early pioneer settlements of which he became a part. He was an expert who could make a razor as well as a sword, an ax or hatchet, a shovel, locks for cabin doors, cranes to hold the metal pots which hung over opened fires, and irons and tongs. He repaired guns and adjusted the flints of the early rifles. He made spears and the fish hooks to catch the sturgeon and game fish. Being an expert at his trade and a prominent and necessary man in the backwoods life, Jourdain was chosen to be the blacksmith for the Winnebago Rapids Settlement Project. In 1835, at the age of 55, he received the job paying $800 a year plus lodging from the U.S. government. His blacksmith shop was erected on the bank of the river. At the front of the rapids, about where the block was located, that is circled in brown. This was located near the current Arrowhead Park, downtown Nina. He would take up residence in the blockhouse, circled in yellow, near the paper mill on Lake Street. In 1838, all attempts to instruct the Menominee had ceased, yet the salaries continued to be paid to the government employees. Declaring the social experiment a total loss, Wisconsin Rapids was deserted and the houses were abandoned to wandering trappers and traders. Jourdain was in full production mode though, making and selling spears and steel traps to the Menominee. Also, life on the distant frontier without a blacksmith was impossible. 
for there were no ready-made nails, farm utensils, or necessities. Joseph was a true settler and citizen. He would have the preemptive rights under the federal law to purchase the land that he was squatting upon. So, with demand high for his services, Joseph decided to remain and thus become the earliest permanent resident of the town of Manasha. He would remain on this property and work in his blacksmith shop with his son Thomas until his death in 1866. Recall early in the presentation, we discussed the migration of four Native American nations to our area. The man's story who brought the delegations to negotiate with the Wisconsin tribes is very interwoven into the Winnebago Rapids project, Matisse, the Matisse community, and the Jardine story. Eliezer Williams, Episcopal preacher, engaged in missionary work to the United Nation, was in upstate New York, preaching their own language. The tribe was proud of this talented young man, born and raised in an Indian village until the age of 13. They looked to Williams as a leader to help with the matter of resettling the eastern tribes west. The contingent of several Iroquois tribes accompanied Williams to Wisconsin to negotiate for land for those displaced. After the treaties were worked out, Williams remained in Green Bay to be a missionary and teacher at the newly established Episcopal School. At the school, he met a student who, like Williams, was a member of Green Bay's Matisse Society. On March 3, 1823, at age 17, that student, Mary Jordan, daughter of Joseph Jordan, married the 36-year-old Eliezer Williams. The wedding took place in the house, lower right, of the bride's parents. Joseph made a personalized cutlery set for the newlyweds. Mary was gifted extensive land holdings from her Menominee ancestors on the Fox River. After their marriage, they moved to live on the estate of 4,800 acres at Little Rapids. In the 1840s, Williams gained national notoriety when he claimed to be he was the lost dolphin of France, the possible surviving son of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette although this claim was eventually proven false. Even though Joseph Jordan lived over 160 years ago, you can still witness part of his history. The trading post, the old lime house built in 1830 on the shores of Green Bay is still in existence today. Now a personal residence it is one mile north of the UWGB campus. In Alloway, there is Jordan Lane, the Lost Dolphin State Park, named for the claim of Eliezer Williams, became a state park in 1947. It was removed from the list of state parks, but the land still remains a state-owned park in Brown County. It is located on the land where Eliezer Williams and his wife Mary lived, five miles south of De Pere on County Trunk D. There are several items produced by Jordan in two different museums. A good share of the items displayed in this presentation, the pipe tomahawk, wedding gifts, kitchen utensils, along with his wife's rifle, are in the Green Bay at, in Green Bay at the Neville Museum. In Nina, at the Doty Cabin, you'll be able to see, as Tom was able to hold, his wife Marguerite's gun and gun powder pouch. As you can see, he was a talented blacksmith, and we still have a chance to see his work. Let us leave the Joseph Jordan story and see how his legacy and descendants helped shape our two communities. This last section will discuss Joseph's descendants and the lasting legacy that they leave on our community. First, we'll look at the second generation, his son, Thomas, and then the third generation, his grandson, LT, and wife, Anne. The generational discussions are best when evaluating the events that were unfolding in the United States. This second generation 
faced changing times. 1840 to 1880 is when Wisconsin became the 30th state. Also, the Civil and Indian Wars were causing major dis disruptions. Building railroads and developing new technologies like the light bulb were improving lives. The railroad finally came to Nina in 1861 with the Chicago Northwestern. The second generation will need to build and organize the Twin Cities. Joseph's youngest son was up to the challenge. Thomas Jourdain was able to utilize his family heritage and build relationships with both the Menominee and the founders. He was well respected by the Menominee and it was said in the Appleton paper, they looked upon him with reverence. During their annual visit to the hunting grounds, they never failed to call on Tom, receiving good advice from him. Thomas was 15 when his father was assigned the job of blacksmith at the Winnebago Rapids project. He was their only child to come to Menasha. Tom would join his father in the blacksmith businesses, including expansion of an additional shop in Winneconne. Thomas was a large, powerful man, over six foot tall, weighing over 250 pounds. On being the Menasha city marshal, the Menasha press said, his appearance was a greater effect on a crowd of ruffians than a revolver or a club. In the 1840s, Nina Menasha founders, Governor James Doty and Harrison Reed were developing plans to purchase land from the US government. At this point in history, the founders and settlers began to work together to build the communities. Thomas Jourdain was in the middle of this transition. Doty, now governor, would travel to his home on the island and hold councils with the remaining Menominee and current settlers. Thomas was one of the settlers Doty depended upon. Thomas will marry Rebecca Slover in 1861. They retained his father's blacksmith business and lived in the family home with his parents. Later, the couple moved to one of the Winnebago Rabbits project farms near the present day Fritzy Park. The Jordanes were childless. However, in 1863, when Thomas was 40, they adopted a boy. In 1871, the family moved to the city of Menasha. Later in life, Tom would work for the community as street commissioner, head constable, policeman, marshal, and postmaster for both the village and city of Menasha. Just last year, the Whiting paper mill on the island had a major fire. Did you know that in 1888, that same mill was destroyed by a more devastating fire? Thomas Jourdain was one of 16 killed in the disaster. On a warm August evening, 1888, a fire started in the boiler room. The fire alarm brought several hundred people to the area, many crowded on the top of boxcars for better viewing. An explosion occurred in the 10 ton boiler shot out of the building and across the tracks through a throng of spectators mowed down like grass. Thomas was one of those standing on a back boxcar. At 65, he was gravely wounded. On the left is the boiler tank and on the right remains the Whiting Paper Company. Little Lake Butamore is visible behind the cars. This is what it was said of Thomas in his obituary. He truly was up to the task of building bridges and organizing our community. Menasha, Wisconsin, August 27, 1888. At four o'clock Sunday morning, Thomas S. Jourdain breathed his last. This adds one more to the horror of last week's making 15 in all who paid the penalty of viewing the burning of the Whiting paper mill. The deceased was one of the best known men in northern Wisconsin, made so by his early history, which antedates the state of Wisconsin. When Governor Doty erected his log house on Doty Island and administered to the wants of the Indians, whose homes covered the northern expanse of Wisconsin, Thomas Jourdain was a power with the various tribes. The deceased, who was thoroughly conversant with the languages and customs of the Oneidas and Menominees, 
was a factor in allaying the differences existing between the red man and the early settlers. Thomas S. Jourdain was born at Green Bay, August 15, 1823, and received his early education, which was not meager, at that city. At an early age, he exhibited an aptitude truly marked in pacifying the various tribes of red men who were then in large numbers in the state. Governor Doty, territorial governor, held many a council with familiar Tom at his gubernatorial log mansion on Doty Island. The next generation faced different challenging times. For the third generation, we'll look into the 1890s to the 1930s when facing World War I and the Great Depression. However, America was also developing and producing unimaginable technologies and products. Automobiles and airplanes expanded their world as well as electricity, radio, and television. The third generation will need to develop and grow the Twin Cities. Thomas's adoptive son and family were up to the challenge. The French and Indian bloodlines are gone. However, in adoptive son Louis, the spirit lives on. This generation will be part of a major growth in the two cities. The grist and flour mills will give birth to the powerful paper industry. Lewis, known as one of the early business pioneers, was involved with several businesses, including a startup paper mill and in contact with many powerful local business owners. Lewis, born February 11, 1861 in Racine, moved to Menasha, being adopted by Thomas and Rebecca at the age of two. He began his business career working at the Menasha Woolen Mills. In 1911, and two other, and with two others, he started the Lakeside Paper Mill. Lewis would become the vice president and treasurer. The president was his best friend and neighbor, Ed Lockman, who would later become Nina Mayer. Chris Walter, owner of Walter's Brewery, Brothers Brewery in Menasha, was also on the board of directors. Later, LT, as he's known, will own his own travel agency, real estate, and insurance business. He was awarded the Gold Award by the Niagara Insurance Company. Deeply religious, he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, Catholic Knights, and the Holy Name of Society of St. Patrick's Parish. Other business associates were banker and manufacturer W.P. Hewitt and J.L. Fewiger, the Lakeside Mill business partner and president of the Bank of Menasha. L.T. Jordan was part of the turn of the century development and growth of the Twin Cities. Being a part of the business community at this time in history must have been a thrilling adventure. On November 14, 1882, Lewis would be joined in marriage with Anne Langcraft of the Menasha Langcraft Hotel family, Upper Left. They would reside on Doty Island, East Forest Avenue. Their residence, Lower Left, was most recently on the Doty Island walking tour of historical homes. The Jordanes would have five children. Three would remain in Nina Menasha and develop businesses of their own. One of the girls is our grandmother, Grace Jordan. Anne was born in 1862 in Menasha and grew up in a civil service oriented family. Her father was elected Menasha's weightmaster, street commissioner, and city supervisor. Anne was very involved in community affairs herself, being a member of the Catholic Daughters, Sanctuary Society of St. Patrick's Church, and Nina's Emergency Society. Like her husband, these activities allowed her to be involved with many of the movers and shakers in the area. Some of them were Mrs. C.B. Clark, Mrs. D.L. Kimberly, and Mrs. H.K. Babcock. These contacts led to the development of one of the most vital organizations in the Nina Menasha area that is still in existence today.
That organization is the Nina Menasha Visiting Nurses Association. Let me tell you about that story. At the turn of the century, many families were prospering with the growing community and businesses in the area. But other families were still being left behind and struggling to survive or need just simple health-related services. In 1906, the Emergency Society invited the public to support a fund to aid those needing help. The response from the public was very generous. So much that they were able to provide outfits, wraps, and blankets for babies. With this success, these ladies saw a deeper, long-term need that could be addressed. So in 1908, an invitation again was extended, inviting many of the people of Nina Menasha to the home of Mrs. J.A. Kimberly. The purpose was to secure sufficient funds to employ a trained nurse in the Twin Cities whose duty would be to respond to the call of the sick and needy as reported by local physicians. The result of that effort was a meeting later at the S.A. Cook Armory. The organization, the Visiting Nurses Association, was founded. In 1955 photo on the right shows six of the seven founding members. Anne Jourdain was seated to the right. Next to her was Mrs. Eveline Bergstrom in the back row, Mrs. Ellen Bonta, Mrs. Laura Pinkerton, Mrs. Geraldine Kimberly, and Miss Anne Pleasance. Not pictured is Mrs. John Shields. The activities of the visiting nurse consisted of the following. Every type of bedside nursing, maternity nursing, and instruction, follow-up work on patients discharged from, discharged from the hospital and the sanitarium, the child welfare, and with baby clinics. Today, in 2022, 113 years later, the VNA is in existence and thriving through changing its mission through the years. The current focus is the elderly, and their vision statement is as follows. The provider of choice for in-home care, independent and assisted living, a resource for seniors and their families, and in our communities. The lower left photo is the old VNA building. In 1956, the Kimberly family donated the building located on 404 East Wisconsin Avenue. Our story has come full circle. 120 years later, in the area on, the Wisconsin, on Wisconsin Avenue, where the row of block houses were built for the Winnebago Rapid Settlement, from Jordan, Joseph Jordan and his son Thomas, settling the building in the cities of Nina and Menasha, to grandson Louis and his wife Anne, helping develop the, the communities to grow, leaving one long lasting legacy. Well, we've come a long way. We covered a lot of ground. We started the presentation with the discussion of the transition of the land from a nominee nation to the US government and ended with the de development and growth of the Twin Cities. In, we be in between, we discussed a man that emigrated to this country from Canada and his impact on Wisconsin and specifically settling the area of Nina Menasha. It was a pleasure presenting this program this evening. Thank you for taking the time to be here or to watch it, and we hope that you enjoyed it. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. As we move forward with this presentation series that we'll be uh, providing to you, we'll be featuring, the next story we'll be featuring will be the story of the Kimberly family, John and Harvey Kimberly, and the home that they built on Wisconsin Avenue in 1848 and 1849. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Tom and Jim and Nick and Kathy for all your work on this presentation, and we hope you enjoyed it. Have a good evening.